Pastor David Blevins preaches on Psalm 27. Go ahead and open them to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. Well, do you ever struggle with fear? Maybe fear of the unknown? Fear of the unknown is something I struggled with as a little boy. I remember my mom signed me up for a week-long soccer camp. Now let's address the elephant in the room really quickly. You can tell just by looking at my physique that I do not have a soccer player's body. And the thought of running on a soccer field, chasing a soccer ball around, brings fear to my mind to this day, which is why I gravitated towards football. You get to hit somebody. <laughs> um, I remember leading up to that camp, though. All week long, I had this fear of the unknown. What was the coach going to be like? What were the other kids going to be like? My fear of the unknown was so paralyzing as a little boy that I remember driving to the soccer camp with my mom in the car, and I climbed in the back seat of the car and hid on the floorboard. That's where I was. In my adult life, my fear of the unknown did not leave me until I surrendered to the Lord. For 25 years, I felt the call on my life to preach God's Word. And I never told a soul, not even Stacy. I've been preaching for eight months, so you can do the math. You see, I wanted guarantees. I wanted to know that if I did X and Y, Z would happen. But the more I resisted God's call, the more frustration I felt. The desire to preach His Word welled up into me to where it was almost unbearable. In a way, I felt like Jonah, who was called to speak the truth to a de wicked and deceived people group. He knew what God wanted him to do, but God's plans didn't mesh with Jonah's plans. So he ran, hard and far, even to the point of asking sailors to throw him over into the ocean. That's where I was. I had so much fear, I lacked so much courage, that I would have been rather thrown into the ocean than surrender to God's call. But by God's grace, He pursued me and continued to call me until all I could do was surrender. And then I was afraid if I surrendered, things wouldn't work out how I wanted them to. I wanted to know that I would see fruits from my efforts. So I asked God for reassurance. I asked Him for guarantees. Instead, God asked me a question. He said, do you trust me? God wanted me to put my trust in Him and let go of our fears. Our fears are directed in so many areas of our lives, aren't they? Fear of the unknown, fear of sickness, disease, death, fear of people, fear of losing our jobs, fear of being misunderstood, fear of being criticized, fear of being rejected. But where do we go with those fears when a crisis hits? Where do we go when the going gets tough? Do we go to God? Do we pray in those situations? But more importantly, how do we pray in those situations? Sometimes we're not prepared to pray in a crisis, especially if that's the only time that we do pray. Our prayers turn into more of prayers of panic than anything else. It's a very different attitude that David has in Psalm 27 today. In the psalm before us, we find a prayer of absolute trust and confidence in the midst of this trial. But back to my original question. What makes you afraid? Try not to be a tough guy or gal and say nothing makes me afraid. Be honest. Is it lack of money? Is it not knowing what the future holds? Is it health? Is it COVID? Is it the 2024 elections? Is it the direction our country's headed? Threat of war? What makes you afraid? The Bible has a lot to say about fear. In fact, some of Jesus' final words to his disciples 
or to take heart and not to be afraid. Additionally, there are several verses that encourage us not to fear. Here are just a few. Isaiah 41.10, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. My favorite one, 2 Timothy 1.7, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. And one I'm sure we're all familiar with, Psalm 23.4, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your staff and your rod, they comfort me. Well, in my studies of the Psalms this summer, I came to the conclusion that David really struggled with fear. But he teaches us in Psalm 27 how to handle this fear. And so this is how I've divided Psalm 27 up. Verses 1 through 3, it's all about seeking the Lord by faith. Verses 4 through 6, it's about seeking the Lord by focusing on Him. Verses 7 through 12, it's about seeking the Lord through a heartfelt prayer, which we're going to get in depth about. And verses 13 and 14, to seek the Lord by waiting on Him. Waiting? I'll explain that in further detail. David really struggled with fear. As a young man, Saul tried to kill him. Then he became king himself, and David's enemies were out to destroy him. David also had more than his fair share of troubles at home. His life was characterized by fear, failures, and anxieties. Yet the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. In this psalm, David writes of his own fears and gives us great instructions on how we can manage our fears. Beginning in verse 1, David says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid of? Now, for those of you that don't know, it should be pointed out that anytime you see the word Lord in all capitalizations, like it is in your Bible or on the screen here, that is referring to the Hebrew translation of Yahweh. It's the, it, they're basically saying Yahweh, the Lord. When David says the Lord, he is not talking about some far unknown God. He is talking about the one true God, the God of Israel, the God who so desires a personal relationship with us. He has given us his personal name, Yahweh, the same name that he gives Moses in Exodus 3. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say, Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. David says Yahweh. The one true God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. That God, he is my light, my salvation, and my stronghold. Now you notice in verse 1, David mentions three things that the Lord is to him. David says, the Lord is my light, my salvation, and my stronghold. One component of light is that what? It gives us direction. As king of Israel, David would need divine guidance and direction. We may not be kings or queens, but we too need direction in our life. The world is a dark place, and at times darkness can be consuming and overwhelming. Fear and anxiety can paralyze us. We don't know what to do next. When we're afraid, what next step do we take? What we need is light, and God is our light and our direction. The word salvation here is referring to deliverance. David needs deliverance from whatever crisis is causing him to fear and to be anxious. How many times has God delivered us from heartache and turmoil and fear and anxiety? How many times in my life have I cried out to the Lord, if you don't intervene, I'm not going to make it. But how many times have those situations been due to our own bad decisions? And we still ask God for help. And He came through again and again and again giving us multiple chances. How many times has God been your light and your salvation? How many times has he been your direction and your deliver? David says, Yahweh is my light and my salvation. And then he says he's my stronghold. Do you remember when you were a kid? Remember playing the game tag? 
Remember that? I think that's a game that covers all generations. Everybody plays tag. Remember someone was always it? And what was its job? Its job was to chase you so that you could become it. Now, when I played that game, I was always it for some reason. My mom just said I was husky. That's why I wasn't fast. But I was always it. But in the vicinity of that game, remember there was a, a place called home base? Remember you could run to home base? And when you got to home base, what did you call? I'm safe. You can't touch me. And as long as I stayed in contact with home base, it had to go where? Somewhere else. And I could stay at home base and be safe. Well, David is saying, the Lord is my stronghold. The Lord is his home base. As long as we stay in contact with the Lord, it has to go somewhere else. David says Yahweh is his home base. In the game of life, you can run to God, your stronghold. And once there, whatever is chasing you has to go somewhere else. As a stronghold, God is your defender, protecting you from all forms of it. Yahweh is our light and our salvation, our stronghold. God is our direction, our deliverer and defender. Therefore, because of all this, whom shall I fear? But what is causing David to be anxious? What's causing him to be anxious? Look with me to verses 2 and 3. When evil men, when evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege my heart, besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. Notice David doesn't say if evil men attack him. He says, when evil men attack him. Things are going to happen in this life that are going to cause us to feel at times afraid and anxious. But that's when we need to remember what he says in verse 1. Yahweh is my stronghold. Yahweh is my light and my salvation. David was facing crisis from personal friends and public attacks. He was facing enemies on all sides. People wanted him dead and nations wanted to conquer him. David felt as if his whole life was falling apart. But through reminding himself that Yahweh is all of these things, he's a stronghold. He's able to feel safe. His fear will flee. The threats were real, but in reality, there was nothing to fear at all. David could run to home base and be safe. David continues in verse 4. The one thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. It is of my opinion in studying this psalm that the key to this entire psalm is in verse 4. The one thing we must do, the key to maintaining our sanity when things around us are crumbling is to seek the Lord. Since I've been in the ministry a whopping eight months, one of the things, one of the questions I've come to learn that people like to ask is why does God allow bad things to happen? And I've learned quickly not to give a simple answer. I've learned through humility to say I don't know at times. But the one thing I do know is that when those bad things happen, God wants us to seek him, not run from him. When faced with trials and tribulations, fears and anxieties, press harder into God. Don't pull away from God. To put it another way, when you're afraid, seek the Lord by focusing on Him. Now David uses his three words to describe what it means to focus on God. He says, I will dwell, I will gaze, and I will seek. By dwelling on God, we gain confidence in Him. By gazing on his beauty, we strengthen our commitment to him. By seeking God, we deepen our communion with him. Now notice what happens when we focus on God instead of our fears. When we take the focus off of ourselves and put it to God, notice what happens. For in the day of trouble, verse 5, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon the rock. Dwelling on God gives us safety. Gazing on God provides us shelter. 
Seeking God results in security. And David then continues. Verse 6, he says, Then, because I'm dwelling, because I'm seeking, then my head will be exalted above my enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Focusing on God gives us a new perspective, replacing our fear with joy and our anxiety with worship. And at first glance of these first six verses, this seems like a really good place to stop the sermon. We've learned that God is our Yahweh. He's the direction. He's our deliverer, our defender. By focusing on God, we gain confidence and strengthen our commitment and deepen our communion. As we seek Him, God promises safety, shelter, and security. And as a result, God gives us a new perspective, turning our fears into joy and our anxieties into worship. That would be the summary of those first, first six verses. Amen. Sermon over. Juan and the worship team, make your way up. But the reality is, as great as these things are in helping us overcome fear and worry, fear has a way of climbing its way back in, doesn't it, into our lives. And when they return, they often return with vengeance. What do we do then? When fear and anxieties return, and they will return, seek the Lord by redirecting your focus to the Lord through heartfelt prayer. David continues in verse 7. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer. Can you feel the pain in David's voice? Can you sense the fear and anxiety and desperation? Have you ever been there, pain, fear, and anxiety? Have you ever cried out to God in a heartfelt prayer? That's what David's doing here. He's crying out to God in a heartfelt prayer. But what is a heartfelt prayer? Well, number one, a heartfelt prayer is a prayer that flows out of an awareness of your need for God. David knows he needs God to intervene. If God doesn't intervene, David knows he's going to be destroyed. And so his prayer is flowing out of an awareness for his need for God. Second, a heartfelt prayer recognizes the needs for God's mercy and grace. Apart from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we have no right to ask God for anything. But because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we can come into his presence with humility asking for grace and mercy. And through his heartfelt prayer, David recognizes his need for God's grace and for God's mercy. And third, a heartfelt prayer is a prayer that expects answers on the basis of faith. On the basis of faith. David is expecting answers. And you can see how I have that underlined in that verse. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me, which we just looked at, and answer. We expect answers on the basis of faith. And fourth, a heartfelt prayer is a prayer that seeks God himself, not just answers. Look at verses 8 and 9 with me. My heart says to you, my heart says to you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. In these verses, we clearly see that David is seeking God. And it is of my opinion in this verse that David is repenting. He recognizes God has every right to hide his face and turn away in anger. Yahweh has every right to reject him. But David is crying out in repentance for mercy and help. More important than being delivered from our circumstances is being delivered from our sins. And salvation comes from God and God alone. Yahweh is our only hope. David continues this thought in verse 10. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. The Lord is David's only hope. And as David says, even though his parents forsake him, God will receive him. And God will receive you too today. If you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, he will accept you. Fifth, heartfelt prayer is a prayer that is linked with obedience, especially during times of trials. David says in verses 11 and 12, teach me your way, O Lord. 
Lead me in the straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desires of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. If I were to summarize that verse, it would sound like this. God, is be, God, God, I am being mistreated and abused. I don't deserve what I'm going through. People want me dead. I'm praying to you to help. Tell me, God, what you want me to do, and I will do it. It is extremely important to be obedient to God. It's vitally important when we ask God for help and direction, when he does speak, that we obey. When your world is falling apart and there is danger, discouragement, and depression on all sides, press into God harder. Press into his word and be obedient when he does speak to you. And finally, the last thing this psalm tells us to do when we are afraid and anxious is continue to seek the Lord by reaffirming your faith in him. David says this, I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. David finds confidence in the righteousness and goodness and justice of God. In the end, as hard as things were for David, God's goodness will prevail. Until that time, David implores us to wait. Wait? He's been teaching us to seek this whole time. And now he wants us to wait? Over and over again, David says, seek the Lord. The truth is, waiting on God and seeking God go hand in hand. When we seek God with everything we have and everything we are, and we wait on God for directions and next steps, if we act too soon or respond too quickly, we usually will make a bad decision worse, which will result in greater fear and increased anxiety. When a scuba diver is diving in the ocean and they get entangled in seaweed or fishing line, the first thing they're taught to do is to wait. Calm down. Relax. If they panic... When they're caught up in that seaweed or fishing line, they're only going to make the tanglement worse. But if they relax and they wait and they calm down, they can slowly untangle themselves. The more you fight fear, the more we will entangle ourselves and the more fearful and anxious we will become. When faced with hardships in life that cause us fear and anxiety, the more you try on your own, the more entangled you will become. Instead, seek God, take a deep breath, and wait on God to bring you out of the fear you're experiencing. And so to summarize these 14 verses, Yahweh is your light, your salvation, and your stronghold. He's our direction. He's our deliverer. He's our defender. Therefore, I have nothing to fear. Instead of focusing on our problems, focus on God dwelling on him, gazing on him, seeking him. When fear and anxiety persist, the most important thing we can do is to seek the Lord. But how are we to seek the Lord? We're to seek the Lord by faith. We're to seek the Lord by focusing on him. We're to seek the Lord through heartfelt prayer, and we're to seek the Lord by waiting on him. But what are some tools that we can use when fear comes upon us. I have one for you today. I only have one, and I think it's the most important one. I want you to receive the peace of God. When I'm fearful, what am I not at within myself? I'm not at peace. Peace is the opposite of fear. So we want to receive the peace of God. Paul tells us in Philippians 6, my favorite verse, do not be anxious about anything, but through everything with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and what happens? And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds of Christ Jesus. So Paul is telling us, when I'm fearful, when I'm worried, what do I do in that situation? I pray. And when I pray, what happens? 
I received the peace of God. Now we looked at this verse when I spoke on depression, Psalm 142. This is also a very powerful verse for fear. So we can receive the peace of God when we go to God in prayer. But it gets better. Verse 9 says this, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. So in four verses, Paul teaches us how to have peace. When I'm fearful and anxious and worried, I pray. And when I pray, I receive the peace of God. And then if I put all that into practice, the God of peace will be with me. And if the God of peace is with us, whom shall I fear? But I don't want to stop there. I want to go deeper today. I want to look at the peace Jesus has to offer. Jesus explicitly said that he could and would give peace. But the way he would give it would not be through the way the world gives it to us. Jesus says this, peace I live with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Throughout his life on earth, Jesus would often tell people he had just healed or helped to go in peace. This wasn't just his preacher friendly way of saying goodbye. It was an, as an acknowledgement that something in what had just gone down between them and him gave this person a chance to walk away in peace. And Jesus seemed to prioritize this peace even over the physical healings he did. As though fixing their circumstances were not such a big deal. Somehow what was more important was the fact that they were now in harmony with God and they were able to walk away in peace. So what is it that got them there exactly? What is it that brought them this peace that they were able to leave in? We see it in one of my favorite stories of Mary Magdalene. She's at a dinner hosted by one of the Pharisees named Simon. And throughout Jesus' ministry, she had seen Jesus heal people and forgive him of his sins. And at this dinner, she's crying at Jesus' feet. She's crying. She takes her hair and she wipes Jesus' feet and then she anoints his feet with perfume. And as a result of this, Jesus says this, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You see, it wasn't her actions of washing his feet that led to the forgiveness of her sins. It was her faith in him that saved her. And because of her faith in him, she was able to walk in peace. Her faith led to peace. Her faith in him ended her inner turmoil, which brought her peace. This kind of peace only comes when we respond and move and act and risk something for Jesus in a move of faith that shows we really believe he is the Messiah. Jesus hands out this peace to people who see him for what he is and accept him. The people who see Jesus like this don't just think nice thoughts about him. They stand up, they call out, they raise their hands, they push through the crowds and cry at his feet, recognizing his authority and ask for forgiveness. And because of this forgiveness, we can walk in peace. What would it look like today to come to Jesus in faith right now, wherever you are? Whatever circumstance you face. What if you made a bold move to say, I know who you are, Lord. You are the only one that can save me and forgive me of my sins and offer me peace. So back to my original question. What are you afraid of? I want to encourage you that God has an answer to all your fears. And the answer is to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer to all our problems. There's a song written by Jeremy Camp titled The Answer. And I want to read it to you. Why do I want to read it to you? Because I do not have the gift that Pastor Josh and Pastor Jeff have of singing. So I'm going to read it. It reads like this. So many questions the world is reaching. So many hurting, so many lost. 
With all this thriving, who can we lean on? Creation's crying out from the dark. I know the answer to every question. The one solution to every fear. I know my helper and where he comes from, Jesus. He is the answer. He sees our sadness. He sees our sorrow. And in our weakness, he is strong. He holds the weight of all of our failings. Great is our sin, but greater the cross. I know the answer to every question, the one solution to every fear. Jesus, he is the answer. For every heart that's breaking, for every soul that's shaking, for every sickness, there's healing in your hands. Let every heart awaken to see that it's you who saves us. You are my help and the rock on which I stand. Jesus, you are the answer. Jesus is the answer to all our problems. As the prophet Isaiah writes, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. Therefore, whom shall we fear? Amen? Amen. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for Jesus' words where he tells us that in this world we will have trouble but to take heart and not be afraid. Lord, I thank you for the peace that Jesus offers us. Peace that is only found in him. Lord, I pray for peace in this church, for every person here. Pray for peace in this world, Lord. Pray for peace for our country. Lord, with you as our rock, with you as our redeemer, who shall we fear? we have to reach out to you. We have to cry at your feet and recognize your authority and realize you are the only one that can offer us this peace. It's not through self-help books. We're not going to find peace on social media. We're going to find it in the name and person of Jesus Christ who lived this life and walked this earth perfectly for us so that we could walk in peace. Lord, I pray for the families in this church who have lost loved ones recently. Lord, heal them, be with them, comfort them. Lord, I pray for the people in this church that are suffering from ailments or they're not able to get to church. Give them peace. Give them comfort and give them hope through the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you. I thank you for this day. Lord, as a church, we thank you for all the blessings you give us. Even the blessings we take for granted. But most importantly, the blessing of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for the potluck meal we're about to experience and receive. Play a blessing over that. I pray for fellowship. Just pray that the spirit would move, Lord, and that iron would sharpen iron. We love you. You are Dove Creek's God, and we are your people. And all God's people said together, amen.